is Seymour Rocks recording from Down Under. I just want to bring your attention to this brilliant uh, analysis of kind of what's happening in America today in the light of the history uh, of the Russian Revolution and uh, Alex uh, Mercurius of the Duran, he makes clear uh, parallels with the downfall of the uh, of the Romanov uh, dynasty, um, and uh, this falls within my own interests in Russian history. And I can say that hearing what he has to say, um, even though it's not the only interpretation, of course, but it's uh, in the light of what's happening today in the United States is uh, very compelling. So I've taken the step of just doing an edit job, editing out all the super chats and other things just to bring you the unalloyed um, uh, interpretation and dialogue between uh, Alex Mercurius and Alex uh, Cristoforo. So have a listen. Uh, I know that you'll learn a lot and hopefully it will give you uh, some cause for thought. All right, Alexander, we have a lot of people from all over the world mm. waiting to, uh, to hear what you have to say about what's going on mm. with the recent escalation in violence. The most recent news that we have is that there was a man executed in Portland. Guys, we will be careful with some of the words that we use yes. because uh, the the people at YouTube, the higher up execs at YouTube do keep a watchful eye over the language that we use. Mm -hmm. So please forgive us if we use some creative language or if we tone mm -hmm. down some of our language as we explain these stories. Mm -hmm. We want this video to stay up on YouTube because we think that what we have to say mm -hmm. should be helpful mm -hmm. and should, uh, should be entertaining and uh, informative. So, informative, uh, certainly, and educational. I mean, educational. I, 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 I don't want to, we don't want to, I mean, obviously we're not an education program, but I mean, I to come to, to what Alex was saying, I obviously there are profound differences. Nobody is suggesting that the United States of today is the same as you know, Tsarist Russia was in the 19th and early 20th century, or that China was when Mao came to power. But there are also some very remarkable and very disturbing resemblances. Now, the, 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 there are two things which I think, firstly, I would point out. One is that amongst an element of the you, what, what the Russians like to call the intelligentsia, amongst the young people especially, there is a growing impulse towards extreme political militancy and what's called direct action and uncompromising behavior and a culture of violence which is beginning to sort of spread and embed themselves. And you could find that, and I think perhaps before I proceed further, I would say that the Russian Revolution is not just in 1917. It's a process that's building up over a very long time. But you can start to see expressions of that in Russian literature. So you have people like Chernyshevsky, for example, and Dobro Lyubov, who are talking about, you know, the fact that, to quote them, uh, a famous quote that Chernyshevsky once made, the worse things are, the better, the more disruption, the more violence, because that's the way we're going to bring down this rotten system in which everything that exists has to be completely wiped out. And we need to start again because the past is all corrupt and what you know and, and all traditions, all history. We need to restart from the beginning. So that was. That was one sort of aspect of this. There's also an aspect that in order to achieve this kind of revolutionary change, you need a culture of violence to carry it through. And that means ultimately it evolves into an acceptance of political violence and terrorism. And if you want to find a book that analyzes that mentality very well, it is the perhaps Dostoevsky's novel, Demons, 
which is all about a group of young people in a provincial town who basically set up some kind of strange revolutionary group. And it is all about violence and terror that they are promoting. And it shows how, uh, you know, utterly demonic, I mean, that's his own language, this whole, for, this whole process and force has become and how it's all about erasing traditions. So there is this aspect, which I think, if you look at some of these people who are rioting and protesting in the United States, especially protesting, and you also see some of these people in the media who are writing about this, you can see parallels with those, with those mentalities. But there is another one, which is that, especially in Russia, in the lead up to the revolution, you saw also that a powerful element of the political class, people who were liberal, looked at all of this and thought they could manipulate it. And they thought they could exploit people like this and that they could use young people and you know people who had become drawn into this strange, these strange ideas, these violent ideas, and that they could be used to try to force concessions from the Tsar and from the Tsarist government in order to bring them uh, to power. Now, the people I'm talking about would classify themselves and would be classified today as political liberals. And they tried to ride this tiger. And when, of course, the revolution eventually came, they found that though they thought they could control these forces that had been let loose in their society, they were unable to do so, and they were completely swept aside. And what happened as a result was a violent revolutionary change and the establishment, in effect, of a totalitarian system. So it was a complete miscalculation by the liberals that they thought that they could control these forces. And at the same time, these forces themselves, there are striking parallels with some of the language, some of the violence, some of the culture of violence that you see in the United States today. So I think that those parallels do exist. There's both, if you like, the proto-Bolsheviks. I don't think they're yet organized in a kind of political force like the Bolshevik party eventually became, but there's a kind of proto-Bolsheviks there. And there's also the liberals who think they can manipulate them and don't understand many aspects of their own philosophy, like the importance of the rule of law, for example, the importance of um, political compromise, of uh, you know, working with forces in a stable way in order to carry out incremental change. Now, I would never once have assumed or thought that things like this could happen in the United States. It is quite dismaying because I studied Russian history at university. It is quite dismaying to see all these same elements reproduce themselves in the United States, such a profoundly different society from the society that Russia was. And one has to wonder again, whether there aren't psychological pathologies that are behind it too. I'm also going to finally finish by sort of saying that there's a language, there's a, there's a culture of language which is connected to the culture of violence, and there is also a general idea about culture. One of the things that happened after the Russian Revolution was that there was a very powerful urge on the part of these people, who were never, by the way, the majority of the population, but they were the ones who, after the revolution, had power or thought they had power. They wanted to completely obliterate everything about the old culture that had existed before. And that meant, uh, you know, blowing up churches and monuments. Uh, um, and establishing an entirely new form of culture, which reflected their own ideologies and ideas as the one that would be replace the traditional culture that the Russian people had. And that cultural element was even stronger in Mao's China, where he was even more clear cut that he and the people around him wanted to destroy everything 
about the traditional China that had existed before uh, uh, Mao came to power. I mean, he even talked about the four olds, the four aspects of Chinese culture that, you know, um, that had existed before that he wanted to destroy. And you had the Red Guards, these young people who were in the universities, who were uh, uh, basically carrying out violence, not entirely dissimilar to the kind of violence we're seeing now, and a kind of ideological um, imposition of ideas, which bears rather disturbing resemblances to some of the woke culture ideas and the way those being imposed that we see today. So that's rather a loose introduction, but perhaps we have much more to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's get deeper into it, Alexander. Mm -hmm. The uh, there, As I was saying before, there was a man that was executed in Portland, and it really was an execution-style yeah. killing. Um, he was wearing a blue Lives Matter patch insignia, I believe, on his, uh, his right or left leg. He also mm -hmm. had a hat from a group, the Patriot Prayer Group, which is a, a Christian pro-police um, group that he was a part of. And he was just walking down the street and he was just literally shot in cold blood. Yes. I mean, for no reason, just killed, bam, that was it. Yes. Now, this, this past week, what we've seen is, if you just reflect on the past one week mm -hmm. of violence, things are escalating at a very uh, scary pace. Yes. I mean, we have... We had what happened to uh, to Rand Paul. We had the, the the riots in Kenosha. We had the the situation with the young seventeen year old gentleman Kyle and what happened there. We had the other day videos of these uh, Antifa BLM. I mean, they're all white kids, so I, I don't know what to make of it. But they're going to restaurants and they're trying to force people yes. to put up their fists. If they don't put up their fists, then they're. I, I mean, I think they're violently attacking them. I mean, they may not be actually hitting them. Yes. At this point, yes. but what they're doing is violent. We also have uh, BLM protesters and Antifa actually riding out to the suburbs mm -hmm. now with bullhorns and telling people to wake up and telling people to get out of their homes and saying that these homes are not yours. Mm -hmm. And this has all happened literally within a one week yeah. time span, which has led now today to this execution on the street. Yes. We also have Alexander people like Bernie Sanders, AOC, Ayanna Presley, and Kamala Harris, who have been telling these people to continue yes. to get on the street. Yes. We yes. haven't really seen the Democrats, no. even Joe Biden, to be honest, we haven't seen the Democrats you know, try to calm things down or to tell people, stop this madness. We really have not seen that. We have to be honest here. And it goes back to the point that you make, that you made, and I would like you to expand on that. To me, it seems that the Democrats, not only Democrats, actually Democrats, maybe neocons, maybe some rhino Republicans, maybe very wealthy oligarchs and very yes. wealthy corporations, yes. they're all trying to see if they can control this BLM, Antifa, mm. mob, these rioters, in mm. order to usher in their perception of this utopia if it's mm. the jeff bezos zuckerberg types maybe it's a utopia mm. where they own everything of the united states and control mm. all the production manufacturing mm. all the money everything mm. if it's you know the the nancy pelosi's mm. obviously they're looking at mm. the neoliberal agenda and they're looking to, to seize power aoc has some other mm. ridiculous wild fantasies in her head and bernie sanders but all these forces has have been unleashed and they've now gone out of control. And I don't think anyone can now, you know, put the genie back in the bottle as far as yeah. these mobs and these rioters are concerned. The same type of thing happened in 1917. As you mentioned, these mm -hmm. forces of evil were unleashed yeah. in Russia and, and a tsunami of violence took hold and which actually did lead to a real civil war. A lot of people think oh, yeah. that it was 1917 and it just ended. We actually had a, a four or five year civil war that Absolutely. broke out to fight for the future of Russia. And we know the results of that. So all the things that I said, Alexander, what do you yeah. make of it? Well, first of all, I think the even most disturbing thing about the event in Portland is not just that, not just that somebody was killed, but that there were people who were involved, well, maybe not directly involved, but that there are people who were celebrating the fact. I mean, this is, this is again, 
a striking parallel to some of the things that happened in the run-up to the Russian Revolution, in, in the sense that you had people who were killed, and the fact that people were being killed was being celebrated by others, by by people, not just the you know the perpetrators themselves, but people who were you know involved with or in league with or part of the same ideological groups as the as the perpetrators and that legitimizes and embeds a culture of political violence it means that the um there is a breakdown of order but not just of order but of basic morality because of course at this point life loses its sacred quality it becomes expendable people are killed and this is somehow uh, something that's actually glorified you can even find early soviet novels which actually talk in this way that you know sort of carrying an execution is somehow a holy act I mean, it seems extraordinary but when I see things like this in Portland, you know, I, and, and people talking in this way and bragging about it and saying that, you know, they're happy that this, this person was killed, a person they don't even know, who might as more than likely was just there. You are absolutely right. When that happens, that is extremely disturbing. And of course, violence has its gains, its own momentum. There was obviously the revolution. There was the civil war which followed, which is a terrible civil war. And then, of course, there was a long period of escalating terror that followed all the way up, right up through the, the terror of the Stalinist era, and which only eventually started to recede after the Second World War, after Stalin's death. So if you get a culture of terror and of violence and of celebration of political violence, that can become very embedded. And if it gains hold in society, it is extremely difficult to uh, change that. But I think the other thing is, and I think this is perhaps where you're even more, the parallels become even more striking, is you mentioned the Democrats. And you're absolutely right. I've heard absolutely nothing from Joe Biden about this. He's not come out and said, you know, this is absolutely unacceptable. We're Americans. All of us are Americans. Every life is important. Every life is important. We mustn't see violence like this in the U.S. cities. Well, you know, I, as you know, the leader, in effect, of the Democratic Party oppose this. And instead of that, we see silence from Biden, support from some Democrats, increasingly you know, vocal support from some Democrats and extraordinary apologias from the Democrats supporting liberal media. If you went, if you transported back to Russia and you went there in, say, about 1910, you'd have found exactly the same thing. There were young people at that time carrying out terrorist attacks in all sorts of places up and down the Russian Empire. And most of the media in Russia, surprising though it may seem to many people, um, in the nineteenth in in the nineteenth and early twentieth century, was controlled by liberals, and they celebrated these things. They supported them. They too used to come up with bizarre euphemisms about you know the mainly peaceful pr protesters who carry out all of these riots. You find extraordinary resemblances there, and again. Alex, you were talking about oligarchs and these powerful uh, people who think they can fund these processes and uh, uh, um, keep them under some kind of control. Um, again, exactly the same thing happened in Russia. I remember once uh, when I was in Moscow going to an extraordinary and beautiful and very elaborate uh, palace in Moscow, and it was the home of a very famous Russian businessman called Morozov. And Morozov was, in fact, the man who was at the time bankrolling the Bolshevik party. He was actually bankrolling Lenin. This is not, by the way, uh, uh, you know, this is this is absolutely well known and acknowledged history. This is before the First World War, before the Russian Revolution. Again, because he thought he could control these forces and he was allied with the liberals in the uh, political system and they wanted they thought that if they could stir up trouble and violence and they could use all that 
to leverage concessions from the Tsar and perhaps ultimately replace him entirely, always imagining that when that happened, it would be they who would take over. I mean, you can still see, you can still find the houses of these people. There's another, uh, there's a Russian banker called Ryabushinsky, who was doing much the same thing with other revolutionary groups at this time. And of course, what happened in 1917 was that they found that they couldn't control these processes, that a culture of violence had taken hold, that law and order had broken down, that the police had become completely demoralized, and that the army was mutinying. And they found that all those levers of control that they thought they had no longer worked anymore. And the economy was also breaking down and the financial system and that their money didn't actually mean very much either. So you see again all these striking parallels between the situation then and the situation now. I, I, I don't want to, as I said, overstate this. There are also huge differences, but the parallels do, you know, do strike one. Yeah, absolutely. There are, there are massive differences. We understand that, but we are trying yeah. to yeah. to navigate this situation. And I think there and are some historical lessons to be learned. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Can I just quickly yeah. also add, I mean, this should serve as a warning and a warning to people in the United States. I mean, you know, there were lots of things wrong in Russia. Uh, there are lots of things wrong in the United States. Just the United States need or want a revolution. I mean, I can't see how it possibly can. I mean, it would be a disaster for the United States if it went down that road. And if you look at Russia, well, of course, it did have a revolution. <laughs> yeah, we all know the results of that. By the way, Alexander, a lot of people are saying happy name day, Hronya Bola, to you, yeah, thank Alexander. You. So happy name day, Alexander. Let me draw another two parallels here. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the media, and I want you to comment on this because mm -hmm. I think this is, this is interesting mm -hmm. stuff. The media tried to demonize, humiliate, mm -hmm. really tried to humiliate mm -hmm. the Tsar and his family, Tsar Nicholas yes. and yes. his family, especially with regards to Rasputin and mm -hmm. Rasputin's relationship mm -hmm. with the Tsar's wife, the Tsarina, and the Tsar's family. Mm -hmm. The media really assaulted the Tsar mm -hmm. and his family because, as you mm -hmm. said, the media mm -hmm. also wanted the Tsar out. Yes. And, and they would do it with flyers and, and misinformation and gossip. And, and all kinds of tactics. Yes. They did that and they succeeded because mm. a lot of people started to have doubts mm. about the Tsar mm. and whether he was capable of leading the mm. country. Mm. Now, my second question to you, I want you to, to reflect on that and give us your comments because the Rasputin angle is also very interesting and the way they tried yes. to humiliate the Tsar and his family is very interesting mm. and they eventually succeeded. But my second question to you is that we're having an election in November. Mm. I've said it and you've said it, and we both have mm. maybe the same reasons, but also maybe different reasons why we feel mm. Trump has to win in mm. November. If Trump does not win, in my opinion, you, the US is in big trouble. Mm. I mean, I really think that a Trump victory is absolutely necessary in order to save the US and to prevent it from sliding into the yes. abyss. You kind of had the same situation in 1917 or with the Tsar as well, because I think to myself, the way they deposed the Tsar and they got him to abdicate the throne was very mm -hmm. devious, mm -hmm. but they did it. Mm -hmm. And I think, what if the Tsar did not listen to his advisors and did not listen to the misinformation Mm -hmm. and did not abdicate. We'd probably mm -hmm. have a very different Russia, I think. Can you reflect on the two points right, that I made? Right. L L lots of things to say here. First of all, I mean, let, let's make one obvious parallel. I mean, one of the points about the Tsar during the First World War, I mean, you know, Russia was in an existential crisis because it was, of course, involved in a war uh, with Germany. Now, the Tsar's wife was German and she had a relationship with Rasputin, but she was actually, well, a, not a sexual relationship, but I mean, you know, she had this connection to Rasputin, who was her confessor and advisor and whatever. But the point was, what really caused a huge amount of damage was that a story was spread and it gained enormous traction that uh, Alexandra, the emperor's wife, the Tsar's wife, 
was pro-German and that Rasputin and the Empress, the Empress were in league with the enemy power. Sound now, does that, does that sound familiar? Exactly. I mean, you know, that it was that. So, and this caused enormous amount of demoralization because, of course, though there was not a scintilla of evidence for this. In fact, Nicholas himself was a deeply patriotic man, uh, um, absolutely committed to uh, victory against Germany. Lots of people believed this. And every time anything went wrong, this was not because, you know, in war things sometimes do go wrong. It was all because of these dark forces, as they were called, you know, that uh, these pro-German forces around the emperor and the court that were constantly plotting to, to you know, to, to help the Germans win. And there was an extraordinary speech that happened in the Duma, the Russian parliament, by a Russian politician called Milyukov, in which he actually straightforwardly accused the Tsar of treason. He said, you know, uh, all these things are going wrong. You know, is this folly, to use his word, is this folly or is this treason? And, of course, he really meant that it was treason. Again, as I said, is this all familiar? I mean, does this remind you of some people, you know, Pelosi maybe, Sh uh, 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 Schiff? Uh, uh, you know, that, you know, it's all that, the, the, you know, Trump is somehow in league with the enemy. Um, so, and this caused tremendous demoralization. Now, Nicholas, he was not a man without fault. And he was easily manipulated by many people around him. And he was pushed into abdication, uh, which perhaps, uh, um, because the protests in St. Petersburg in Petrograd at that point were still only confined to that city. And it's far from clear that the um, military would not have backed him and that most of the population wouldn't have backed him if he'd wanted to hold, hold on. But there's another actually extraordinary aspect about this, because I, I was talking about the collapse of any um, belief in Russia, in in constitution, in law, in due process, and all these things. When Nicholas was persuaded against his wishes to abdicate, he said, look, who takes over from me? I mean, if I go, who, who, who will step in? Do you want me to appoint a provisional government? And the liberals, who, was, who were the people who were pressing him to resign, said, no, we don't want you to promote because we're going to appoint it ourselves. He said, very well, do you want me to recall the parliament? because the parliament had was at that time adjourned. Oh, no, 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 we don't want you to recall the parliament. The reason they didn't want him to recall the parliament because the parliament actually had a conservative majority. So they didn't want it recalled. So they wouldn't, they didn't want that either. So he's, he's, would it be, would it be, would it be then because, you know, he's going to abdicate on his own behalf? Will it be his son? Well, no, we don't want the son either to take over because we don't want any kind of monarchy at all. So the result was Nicholas was persuaded to abdicate and nothing legal, nothing founded on any constitutional or legal principle was put in its place. And the result was because the constitution was torn up, legitimacy broke down. And Milyukov, the man who made that extraordinary incendiary speech, is it folly or is it treason? He set himself up as foreign minister of Russia. And somebody came along. He was, you know, when he went to meet the officials, they said to him, well, who appointed you? Upon what legal basis are you here? And he had no answer. Because the whole constitution, the whole system of government of Russia, was completely destroyed. Same again, we see with this misuse of impeachment processes, with these constant lawfare. I mean, lawfare is actually, there's actually a blog and a very influential blog, by the way, in the United States that calls itself lawfare and is all about using the law in effect as a weapon against uh, the presidency, against Donald Trump. And again, it was this, policy, if you like, this, this attitude that we will destroy everything in order to get at the Tsar. And then once we got rid of the Tsar, we can take over. Only, of course, they found 
the liberals found that they couldn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think the democratic strategy here is uh, because they aren't speaking out against this violence at all? Do you think the strategy mm -hmm. might be yeah. to just keep on ramping it up because yes. they know they are going to lose? I, I, they've accepted the fact that yes. they are going to lose if they go about it in a proper democratic legal way yes the way it's always happened for hundreds of years in the united states yes. so they're saying you know what let's continue to ramp it up what we're seeing right now this past week what we've seen may be mm -hmm. nothing compared to how it may escalate in the next month or two but they may be saying alexander let's push it till the damn thing breaks and we'll force trump Yes. To quote unquote, let's use the word abdicate. Let's yes. just say something like that. Maybe, maybe yeah. they'll steal the elections. Maybe they'll do the mail in ballots. Maybe they'll do like what Al Gore said yeah. the other day, where he said, we'll get the military yeah. to remove him. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're, they're throwing a lot of stuff out there right yeah. now. So maybe they're trying to push the whole thing till it breaks, thinking in their head that they'll just seize power because they know they can't win with a free and fair election. Yeah, well, indeed. well, of course, and that is again a parallel because the liberals in Russia could not have won any kind of free or fair election in Russia in any way or shape or form because they were a tiny minority of the population. And of course, they wanted disruption in order to basically, as I said, leverage concessions from the Tsar and eventually remove him. And it's interesting you mentioned the military because who, how did they eventually force the Tsar, get the Tsar to abdicate? They got the military on their side. They spoke to various generals and they said to the generals, um, the Tsar can't keep order. He's unable to maintain stability. He can't lead our country to victory in the war against Germany. He's obviously compromised with the Germans in some way. Wasn't true, but many people believed it. And what happened was there was this uh, a, a meeting between Nicholas and one of his generals who spoke on behalf of the army staff. And in effect, it was the abdication, the Tsar's abdication, had elements about it, very strong elements of a military coup after all this, all this chaos had been created, and uh, as I said, the liberals trying to manipulate things from from behind the scenes. So there are similarities because I too think that the Democrats are not going to win the election in November. I too think that the Democrats know they can't uh, win the election in November. I too think that they are desperate to gain power, and I think that they, like the liberals in Russia have a tremendous sense of entitlement in assuming that they should be in power. And I think also, again, like the Liberals in Russia, they overestimate their own ability to control things, and they are far too complacent about the stability of their country. Because the United States has existed as a stable country for over 200 years. It had a civil war, but mainly it's been a very stable country. They assume that it always will be. And if they, you know, smash up the constitution and get rid of Donald Trump and take over, it will continue to be stable. Well, the Romanov dynasty had reigned over Russia for 300 years, longer than the United States has existed. And again, that may have made some people in Russia in 1917 very complacent and assuming that it would, things would remain much as they had always been. How wrong they were. And I think the Democrats are wrong in the same way. Yeah, I think one of the biggest uh, weaknesses of this, uh, this revolution that the Democrats are leading yeah. And, yeah. and the oligarchs in the United States are leading and all these evil forces yeah. That are behind it. One of the the biggest weaknesses they have is they don't have a face to lead this no. revolution, like no. like a Lenin Trotsky oh, type no. of figurehead that can lead this revolution. They kind of chose this, <laughs> this Biden in the basement <laughs> kind of character and this empty mm. suit puppet Kamala Harris. Mm. They don't have someone that can actually take on a Trump. 
you know, Trump well, is a well, larger than life character. They don't have the the opposite so that they could push this this terrible revolution through. Well, what do you let, want to make of that? Let, let, let's actually now talk about some of the differences. First of all, American society is completely different from Russian society as it was. I mean, the Russian economy was a completely different type of economy. Russia was a predominantly peasant country. 87% of the Russian people were peasants. That's hardly the United States today. Also, I think that there's a fundamental difference in the sense that the American people, uh, there, there are far more structured resistance to kind of revolutionary change than there was in Russia in, 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 in the early 20th century. But, you know, you're also absolutely right. I mean, uh, Karl Marx famously once said, you know, that history repeats itself. The first time is tragedy and the second time is farce. Well, you know, whatever you may think of Lenin and Stalin and Trotsky and all those people, I mean, they were exceptionally clever and, by the way, exceptionally highly educated people. I mean, they knew what they were doing. They knew their ideology. They were, you know, in some ways very, very remarkable people. You look at the bunch that, you know, lead both the protests <laughs> And the Democrats today. I mean, Sleepy Joe. I mean, he's going to lead a revolution. I mean, it's hardly fair thinking about Kamala Harris. I mean, you know, are you kidding me? I mean, uh, um, you know, Alexandra uh, Ocasio Cortez. I mean, she's going to. She's the. She's the new. You know, Colin Ty or, or or you know, Clara Zetkin. I mean, it's just. It's just. Yeah. So, I mean, the idea that these people, you know, would, would, would be able to lead a revolution is just is just ludicrous. And can I just also say something? I mean, you know, again, if we're talking about parallels uh, and differences, I mean, I've mentioned some of the similarities between Nicholas and, the, you know, the way Nicholas was treated and the way Trump was treated. But they could not be more different as people. I mean, Nicholas was a shy diffident, very intelligent, highly educated man, but very shy, very diffident. He didn't really mix easily with people. He was, he lacked self-confidence. He was, he didn't dominate those around him. He just watched Donald Trump. You see how tremendously empathic he is, how he has this extraordinary ability to speak to the uh, people of the United States. Nicholas had nothing like that. That was one of the reasons why he lost power because he wasn't able to articulate his ideas in a way that the Russian people could relate to. He was he he lost contact with them. Well Donald Trump has certainly not lost contact, at least not with his very big and very enthusiastic electoral base. So I think you know that there are huge differences, but there are also of course striking and important similarities. Yeah. Absolutely. There are massive differences, but we need to always be aware as to what's going on and aware Indeed. of how history has uh, yeah. has treated these types of scenarios so Absolutely. they don't repeat themselves in Absolutely. the United States. I think that's the, the important lesson it, here. It's a warning. And as I said, it's yeah. also a sign. You must never be complacent about these things. I mean, both um, um, Alex and I have lived in countries which have seen massive political changes. We both experienced, uh, uh, you know, coups. And Alex has, you know, had, had the experience of a foreign invasion. We do not take stability for granted. We, we know that stability is something that can be shaken and if violence takes hold we know how dangerous that is i think far too many people in the united states don't really believe that things can go badly wrong well the answer is they always can they always can somebody and i forget who it was once said that the price of liberty is perpetual vigilance and vigilance about observing the constitution observing the rule of law following due process voting properly in elections, people accepting the outcomes of elections, and when other people start breaking those, those transgressing those rules, a critical mass of the people coming together to protect them. That's how stability is maintained. Yeah, we need to have mm. perspective and look at just the last three to four months, mm. how they've moved the goalposts. From what started out as the Floyd uh, 
situation, the killing of Floyd, of George mm -hmm. Floyd. We've now gotten to the point, Alexander, where they are executing people for just yeah. walking down the streets because they wore a patch that they don't Monday. agree with. Or Monday. they're going into the suburbs and they're screaming yes. at, uh, at residents or going to restaurants yes. and, and shouting at people that are just trying to dine, trying to force them to raise their fist. We are one step away from this thing really turning Absolutely. very violent. And I really feel mm -hmm. and I fear that this group of of rioters and protesters and these yes. mobs yes. will now actually decide to go into the suburbs yes. and to just go full attack mode. Absolutely. And if that happens, you know, all hell could break loose. But I do agree with you. I think the American people, there is the majority of the American people, I think, understand this or are, are starting to understand this. They're armed and they are ready for this. I really yes. think that they are starting to get ready for well, the violence that may be coming their way. So, I mean... My, my own sense, just to quickly say, is I think there's been a consolidation within American society over the last couple of weeks. And I think this is starting to be noticed even by the Democrats and they're becoming dismayed by it. But, of course, what that will mean is that the people on the streets, many of whom now are, you know, past the point of no return. I mean, they've done things that they must be very worried about if, you know, coming back to uh, being held account for it. That the risk is that they will escalate because that's also the dynamic of violence. Violence grows because if you stop, if you if you're if you're into a round of violence, if you stop killing people and bragging about it and celebrating it, then you're always afraid, always afraid that you will be held to account and that pushes you further to do more and more of it. So that's always that's always the that's always the danger. Just finish by quickly saying um, the sense of shock and dismay that Russian society had in 1970. There's a very wonderful brief cantata, uh, uh, um, a, a chorus work by the Russian composer Prokofiev called Seven. They are seven. It's all about the coming of the dark and terrible gods that bring destruction wherever they go. And if you want to hear that, you'll see what terrifying music that is. So please don't go there. America. Yeah, yeah I agree. <laughs> and uh, just to wrap it up before we get to... Uh... To the super chats, I want to stress again that yes, it is just a minority of the uh, the U.S. population yeah. that is uh, that's rioting and that that's doing these horrible things. Yes. But we want to stress the fact that back in 1917, though their name says Bolsheviks, they were the minority. Oh, yeah. And yes, right now in the U.S., it may be confined to a few cities, but as you pointed out, Alexander, yeah. in Russia, it was confined to pretty much one city, and then yes. it just you know, spread out of control. Sure. So we have that to uh, to ponder and to the oligarchs and to the Democrats and to the mayors. You mm -hmm. think that you can control the mob and they're not going to come after you. Sooner or later, Zuckerberg and Bezos and all the mayors, they will turn on you and they will come after you as well. You cannot mm -hmm. control these people. Of That's course for not. Sure. Of course not. There's a lovely piece of English dog rule uh, you know, there, there was a young lady from Riga who smiled as she rode on the ti on a tiger. They returned on the ride from the ride with a lady inside and the smile on the face of the tiger. That's what Zuckerberg and company need to bear in mind. Yeah. Not that they will, because they are incapable, I think, of imagining it. And that's the danger. Yeah. The mob always turns in on itself. Always. Exactly. 